Hello and welcome to Garrock Farms. Today we're gonna to give you a shop tour of the shop here on my father's dairy farm. It uh, was built in the 70s, it's a 44 by 80, and he's gonna go through the history of it. He's gonna talk about the construction side of things and how he transformed a Quonset building built in the 1970s to his main heated shop and his main work area. So I hope you guys enjoy the video. Thanks for watching. We bought this farm in fall of 91. This building was already here, a Quonset. It had steel sliding doors on both ends, dirt floor, concrete foundation. And I've seen them where there were wood foundations too. Uh, my dad had a similar building at home for machinery, but this one had concrete. So in 05, we were really thinking about this heated shop. And I talked to a lot of people that started putting heated shops on their farms. And the big question was, is how do we heat it? Do we heat it with forced air? But then we hear that the temperature is so variant. It's like um, the, the consistency of the heat isn't the same. And the few people that had heated floor, which is still kind of experimental then yet, um, they loved it. They wouldn't go any other way. So we started investigating into that and it was a quite a process. The, the floor alone, just the concrete part, I think was like 10,000. And then of course we had all the tubes and then the poly, poly foam, that, that hard uh, styrofoam, you had to put that down. You basically created like a box and then you put your concrete in there. So the concrete's roughly six inches thick, a little thicker in the center to the edges. We have a, a large wood boiler. And I put my first wood boiler in up there, outdoor wood boiler in uh, 1995. We did that and then and when we were doing the shop, we knew we were gonna do the shop in 04, so we updated the boiler to a larger one and got some lines dug in. We got, we got the red one is the hot line coming in and the blue one's your return line going back. We got our manifold and I believe we have we have seven runs in this floor and then we actually ended up with an extra one on the manifold which is just a it's a it's basically a dead run really so there's seven in the floor which means there's um seven loops which go that way and then come back on this side and they they start on the edges and they work their way towards the center so basically you've got seven long loops of of warm water that goes to this floor to heat this floor up this pump is always on as long as you want to heat the building and you got your boiler fired so all this pump here does is, is circulate this water it, it just makes the water come to the shop and pushes the water back and then this here switch and i don't have the proper name for all this stuff now when our thermostat which is up over here but that's set like for instance at 50 degrees so when the temp drops that activates this valve to open and turns on this pump and then right here this little device here is a mixing valve because you don't want to run 180 degree water through your floor you want to run and i'm going to guess maybe 100 degree water 110 i don't know what it is exactly but um anyway but you you mix some of the colder water with the hot water so then that pump will run when this activates and it says you need heat until it heats it up warm enough thermostat says it's warm enough shuts this off and then your pump shuts off and that's pretty much how this works so our floor is pretty much a huge radiator that's really the best way to explain it and the neatest thing yet is the floor is always room temperature the floor is always dry and the only thing some of the newer systems now they'll isolate this boiler water from the shop water but floor water. They will have another heat exchanger in here. So it could be antifreeze, for instance, or something that wouldn't freeze for water. And maybe this one wouldn't, because there's like 300 and, I don't know, maybe 400 gallons of water involved in this setup um, that goes up to my boiler. But in the floor, I don't know, these are pretty small tubes. It might only be 40 gallons, maybe less than the whole floor. I don't know. It's, but anyway, it's a way less. Issue I got, if something will happen to my boiler, um, my lines could freeze in the floor we could end up damaging our, our heating system in the shop if we didn't have this able to run i mean and this could be hooked up to gas you could have get those gas boilers and stuff so you wouldn't need to have the wood boiler since we were running that water down here anyway we put this side arm on on our water heater which basically is a 
pipe inside of a pipe. So you get your boiler water on the outside of your drinking or your washing water or whatever you want to call it. Um, so those two waters cannot mix. And it's just a radiating effect that helps. We don't have electricity on for this right now. My boiler heats our water. And that's just to wash up your hands or whatever down here. We don't, we don't use a lot of it, but it's sure nice to have when you need it. And it costs nothing extra. And whatever heat escapes off of this is warming our building besides. It's a cheap way to heat water, but it's slow. So if you were going to have five, six people taking showers, for instance, these type of systems don't recover really fast, but they're good. They're economical. So on this floor, before we poured the concrete, and after the, the foam was in, and the tubes were in, and the rods were in, and the next day they were going to pour, I got to thinking, one if, okay, I want to mount down an air compressor, or I want to mount something to the floor. I mean, I can't just drill anywhere. I got them heat, them heat tubes in there. So I took a tape measure and I made it from the wall, maybe out about 12 feet, and then maybe down another 20 feet in the main work area. And I made a, like a diagram of where all, because I think my tubes are spaced maybe two feet apart. They're closer along the wall than they are as they get further to the middle. Because that's how they, they said they needed to be done. But anyway, so I know roughly where everyone is. So if I wanted to mount something here, I could avoid hitting those, those lines. Because that, that is one nightmare. Once, once you damage that one line, you have to shut it off and you lose part of your heating. And there's one interesting thing we found out about this building when we started renovating it into a shop. The whole building was built at a slant from one, from the, the uphill side to the downhill side is about six inches, just six inches. And uh, again, to uh, fit it into the grade of our yard, it made it a little less of a ramp in the back and in, in the front too to make everything match up to the yard. But then the floor inside the building from the foundation to the front door to the back door, I always knew there was a, quite a slope, but I didn't realize it was that much. So when they threw a transit on it, we were at 18 inches. And then I thought, now what do we do? Are we going to build a shop with a floor that's an 18 inch drop and 80 feet? And um, it really got me thinking, what should we do? Should we have a ramp on each end and level off the center? Well, I decided we were just going to build it. A straight flat floor from one end to the other with an 18 inch drop and 80 feet. And I don't regret any of it because the neatest part is when we bring machinery in that's covered with snow or whatever from plowing snow or something that's thawing out, any water that comes off that pretty much drains directly out and goes right under the back door and out and the floor is always dry. And the heated floor, again, the temperature down here near the floor and at our level and then way up higher is, is exactly the same. With forced air, it's different. You could have freezing temperature on the floor, you could have 50 degrees at this level, and you could have 80 degrees up there. So when you open them big doors up, and sometimes we're moving machinery around, and they get all that, that gust of cold air comes in, and sometimes both doors are open at the same time, so the wind goes through and takes all the heat out. When those doors are shut, the temperature resumes almost immediately. That, by far, is well worth it. If it's done right, you got to get professional services or, or at least have a lot of experience in it. I would recommend if you're going to do it to get it done right. Every structure, every big project we did, I've always did a lot of research. Come up with a lot of different products, a lot of different companies, and, and then I usually keep all that stuff for reference purposes. The insulation I'm going to talk about, and that was another tough thing, because this is a quonset where you got that you know, the, the walls are sloped, that, and that rafter in here, that's a, a laminated rafter. We got a company right in our small town that built those already way back in the, in the early 70s. That was just two by fours in steel, and how do we insulate this? And I started talking to our insurance companies, and they would frown on this, this foam. Because back in the 70s, these foams that they would insulate with were extremely flammable, from what they'd tell me. And they did not want nothing to do with insuring any building with that stuff in it. And so I started talking to these companies that were introducing this. And we had one product. And this is in 19 or 2005. That's when we did this 
this renovation to the shop so there's this product called ice at the end and i think it's still out today and it was more into homes it would go into the walls you could and it would expand and, and it would be the texture of it was like angel food cake so then i thought well they're gonna spray that on you got this awesome r value six inches thick and then if something would happen to scrape against it or something that would how would we replace that you know they, they came in with a huge truck and it's basically products uh, in two different barrels that meet at the tip of the gun and when they come in contact they expand and just like the stuff you buy in the small cans really but anyway so there was that product and that was about ten thousand dollars to do this building but it was a very good product but i, I wasn't so sure and then the same company came up with this one, this polyfoam. It's been a while now since we did this, so I'm trying to think back of all the specifications on it, but we could get the same R value at three inches, and this stuff hardens to a point where you could walk on it, you'd have to use a claw hammer to remove it. So it was a very good product. This would, and this would add like um, strength to the building, like rigidity so that it would it almost be like uh, uh, more of a bonding to all the metal and all the wood and everything fill in all the cracks and um, that was quite a process but they wanted 13,000 for this product i said well how is it is it flammable is uh, you know you start brainstorming you're thinking well we're going to spend all this money is this going to be um, and, and how is it for longevity and all that type of stuff so i said spray some on Spray some of this isothene on a sheet of steel, spray some of this polyfoam on a sheet of steel, and then I've got like a, a, a chunk of fiberglass, this conventional insulation. We could have did that too, but we, did, we couldn't figure out how we were gonna pin it on, but we had, we had ideas. And so I took all three of those products and I put them outside together and I took my cutting torch out there and I thought we're gonna see which one holds the flame the best. So I started with the fiberglass and I put the torch to it and it lit up and I pulled the torch away and it kind of burned and smoldered for a while but it was burning I almost had to put it out with you know something besides so then I went to the, the isothene it did hold flame but not nearly as long it kind of snuffed itself out and then I went to the polyfoam and I held that torch on that product and when I pulled it away it went out instantly and it probably will burn, but it will, they claim it would take wood and other materials. We did throw that whole idea that it was something, it wasn't something we had to worry about. Um, because we're running tractors in here, we're torching in here, we're welding in here, we're using things that could, you know, ignite that, so we didn't want to have a complete disaster. Thought it through and we, we thought we were going to go for the better product. And right now, today, there's three inches of insulation up there and there's snow on the roof and it's 60 degrees in here right now and it's been 20 below outside you know it's a good product we're getting what we we set out to do well then there was lighting we knew we were going to need a lot of lighting and the overhead doors the front door the main door we use it it was smaller on the original building i had to kind of make that opening bigger um, that is a 14 by 20 and then the back door i believe is a 17 by 13 and a half and that's what the back door was when I felt, well, for this operation, that, that's still pretty good. But then the other plan was, is okay, do you put windows in it? And I've had people come up with all kinds of theories, whether you should or shouldn't, or where you should place your roll windows. This door company, they were advising, put them in. The daylight, there is nothing like daylight. So we decided to go with the full view, which is windows all the way across. And that is... I would never go any other way. You see a lot of them with the smaller windows and stuff. And, and if you're worried about security things, we didn't want anybody seeing in, just put them up higher. You'd still get your sunlight. So when the sun is out or the day is pretty bright, you don't need lights in here. You can work on stuff just fine um, without using your lighting. But I was determined we were gonna have very good lighting. So first of all, we come up with these 400, I don't know if they're 450 watt each. I put three of those in. So I talked to this light guy at a farm show and he sold me three of those. And they were supposed to have all this energy efficiency and stuff. You can see that this part here came on top of them and you got your lamp and then you got your shade and then you see that wire going up to that box on there. That box used to be attached to the top of that light. That was their original versions, but they claimed the heat from the bulb would affect that. I think that's like a starting device, and I'm not sure the terms they would use for that, but 
that's 220 that those those lights are uh, hooked up to all the lighting in here is on 220. so they come up with this theory that they would have it on a on a piece of conduct that would take it a little bit further away from the lamp and um, so it didn't get warm from the bulb and they would last longer. So we put those three in, they're pretty bright, but still, and once we started doing other stuff to the shop where we got our work area and stuff, we, I started thinking, well, let's, let's see what else is available. So we started putting these fluorescents in um, and he had like these reflectors um, on there and those reflectors, I think they're like aluminum, almost like a aluminum foil type reflector, but it it's, it's, was designed to fit those, those fluorescents. And each one of those bulbs, I think, are 32 watt, which there's probably better efficient bulbs today. There's so much stuff out. But those are probably the best ones I could get at that time. So we put, I think, six of them in on the front, and then we kept adding to it. So the course of the whole winter, we eventually had, I think we got... Uh, we must have about 15 of those in here already. So we did some figuring here on uh, our lighting. And we counted up all our fluorescents and our 450 watts lights. And we're, we're coming up with 3,400 watts of lighting in this building. And the one thing I've noticed is, so we're in here, got all these lights on. We're working on stuff on a dark night. And then we get done shut all the lights off and walk outside, we feel like we're completely blind. It's that bright. Trying to simulate daylight. And I'm sure the deficiency of the modern lighting is a lot better than it is, was back in uh, 2005. But um, again, the lights aren't on every day, all day. Okay, so the, the electrical, pretty much just a 200 amp. I mean, we, it was way better than what was in here when we came to this farm, but anyway, you see how I got everything labeled. And we get to be a firm believer in that, just a, and, and a lot of 220, because the stray voltage with, with dairy animals especially, they, they claim that's still the better way to go. And the other thing I wanted to do is put everything in the conduit. There is no exposed wiring in this building at all. Everything is inside iron. So if anything would malfunction, any kind of short of any kind, and everything's got a, its own ground wire, we really kind of went beyond what was necessary. So there's circuits on just about everything in here, as, as far as I could get it to go with this much um, room. And then what I did here is I put a gang of switches in, and when I leave this building, at night. I wanted it this way for security purposes. I wanted to have everything dead to this point. There was no electricity in this building except for my heat, my refrigerator, and my freezer. Otherwise, everything was off as long as all these switches were off. So that we, if there was any kind of, so we had cords plugged in from tools and, and we didn't have to worry about something going wrong and igniting something thing. Because let's face it, when it's cold out, we have all our main equipment in here. We got our best tractors in here. We got all our fine tools in here and to lose all this stuff would be, it would be huge. So it's well worth bending over backwards to prevent something disastrous from happening. So now for instance, all the outlets, especially in our main work area here are numbered and they're all on a separate circuit. So two things could be plugged in at a time and not be blowing our breaker. So it makes it very easy to know where everything is. And then here, my cutoff saw, for instance, it's actually out of its holster right now, but, but that would go on this stand, that would get plugged in here. And then I got switches where I could just shut off the switch instead of be unplugging and plugging them in all the time. It's very hard on the cords and stuff. I just feel more comfortable with everything set up that way so that we don't have to worry about something going wrong when we're not here and causing a problem. I mean, you get, you get cords and things, they get beat up from working with them all the time, so. But then along the wall here, I thought, well, how are we gonna attach all this to the, to the wall? This building is not built to have all kinds of stuff fastened to the wall. And you think of all the tools and hardware, there's, tons of stuff. So I, under here, I have this bracket and I made it to fit the floor, fit the wall, and it comes up through here. And then, it, so I got a, a lower deck and a top and an upper deck. And I just made one. 
And then what I did is I came out here on the floor and I used this natural groove in the floor and I laid it there once I've realized it fit the, the side and I traced around it and then I imitated and I made one for every, I think there's one every four feet because that's where a rafter is. So I could fasten it to the rafter and the weight of those shelves is all on my floor. But I didn't want to have to put the posts and stuff out further or clean up or it's always interfering with something. So we're able to put put a lot of things under the bench area and be able to retrieve them in and out without all this interference. And then I put this this fascia on kind of more just to dress it up. It's just basically white fascia. You know, and then the upper one here too, there's brackets here. So this one is totally hanging on the building. So after this building was insulated, I mean, I thought, well, how are we gonna, how are we gonna protect that from all getting dirty? And, and uh, I was thinking we put this, this, this is just roofing steel. I thought we could put it all the way to the peak. I mean, we really thought of doing it, but this building, I realized this structure wasn't built to handle that kind of weight. Um, if I was gonna do it again, I would've either had heavier rafters or more of them to handle a layer of steel on the outside, all that insulation and a layer on the inside, plus all this other stuff that you're attaching to the walls to hold the weight. So we went up just nine feet. So we basically got three three-foot sheets up to nine feet. They're white, they reflect the light very well. And then up higher, I didn't think it really mattered. I mean, we don't really have to necessarily cover that. It's more just for cosmetic purposes to look nicer. We could paint it. We could have painted it white too, to get it a little brighter look. But again, and then on, this is the opposite wall from our tool side. Again, there's a, there's I think there's two or three circuits inside this this conduct going down, and further down there's just a box every I think it's every ten feet because that's the length these pipes came in. So I just roughly went every ten feet, and then some of them we don't have outlets in them, but I have the wire in there coiled up so that there would be enough extra wire inside each one of those boxes. If I wanted to put an outlet there, I could pull that wiring out, cut it, and then splice it into an outlet. And otherwise, it's been one continuous strand going through. So we're kind of thinking ahead in the future, if we ever wanted to add something more to this shop. Um, so uh, we, we hosted two dairy breakfasts on this farm, one in 05, and that was part of the reason why we wanted to get this building done then. We had the floor in, our doors in for the dairy breakfast in 05, and then in 2000, was it 19? I think, yeah, before everything shut down, we had it. Anyway, so the first dairy breakfast we had, we had all these pictures, history of this farm. And we had them on plywoods and stuff, and then that was over, we took them all off, and we were gonna just put them in albums, and I thought, we, gotta, we wanna put these up. I wanna put them up where we don't have, where we can show them. They shouldn't be in a drawer in a house someplace or a closet. They should be out where we can see them. So what I did is we took the, these strips of, this is just two by six rip, and I got a groove in there so these pictures slide into them. And we were able to put a bunch of history together of this farm and different things that we've done over the 30 years we've been here. And it really makes a nice conversation piece. And they're angling down <laughs> so that the dust doesn't collect on them. And then I can put my air hose on and kind of whisk over them and blow the dust off too. And I've been adding to it and there's some on the other end too, but it's endless. We have plenty of, of ceiling space to put them on. So it's really, uh, if, I would, if we want to talk about any kind of history what, or anything we've done, it's easy to come here with whoever and show it. Now this would be the back end of our shop and, and initially just for a short little while we thought should we petition this building you know not to heat the whole thing did we need that big of a shop because I thought it's going to be a lot babysitting this boiler to keep this building warm and, well that idea got thrown away pretty quick because I thought we got one nice big building we're going to make two small ones out of it no way it's never it seems like it's never big enough anyway and that's just so we done the whole thing, so now the back, this, this all got added later. Again, this, the shelving is very similar from the front. Uh, this is more of my woodworking type area, more, more uh, that type of stuff. And I, and I got, like I got, I don't know if there's seven outlets above the bench here, and they're on a switch. And, and if every switch is pointed towards the door, that means they're off. Pointed away, everything's on. So I have to look under there and decide which way it's supposed to go. But 
This switch turns on all the outlets, so I can these stuff plugged in. And then we got our two light switches, which are back here for our fluorescents. Well, we have uh, probably about eight different remotes for the doors, and there are them double ones. So there's one switch is for the back, one for the front. We keep on our main machines that we use in the winter. And I do got a couple of them up front. So when I come in here in the summer months, I automatically you just open both doors. And the neat thing with the doors on each end, so if I'm welding in here, especially even in the winter, and you get that haze of that smoke or whatever from a tractor you just started, you open both these doors and there's a light breeze. It don't have to be much. And all that exhaust instantly goes out and you shut your doors. There's, we thought of putting a fan in, but there's no need. I know guys that got doors on, on just one end, for instance, and which is good, but yet the exhaust part, it gets hot in there, it gets stuffy in there. When we open up both, we got a light breeze going through here in our summer months. We wouldn't have planned that, it just happened to be that way. The building happened to be that way. So if you can, I, I like that idea. Now here we got still the old sliding doors. This door was high enough, I think it's like 13.9 or whatever it is, but it was high enough so we weren't going to redo the opening, make it bigger. So we left the old sliders on and we get some pretty bad weather, some really cold weather. I can shut these two sliding doors besides this door. It's almost like a shutter. This is the north side of, the, of our building. This is the one that gets the coldest. Th these doors are insulated, but this section from here to here, that's, that's all iron. There's not much insulation value in this. And you can put this section anywhere in the store. You can put it near the top, or we put them at this level so you know, we can visually see what's going on out in our yard when we're working in this building. I will never do it any other way than these, they call that full view, where you can see the whole, you know, you got a lot of, lets a lot of light in it besides. We put a light on the front here, and that light, that shade that was around that ended up falling off now i might have to replace it anyway but it only came at that little elbow and most guys will put them rest on the gable so it only lights the front of the building but i got to thinking let's i got another piece of conduct and extended it up higher so it, it actually the light goes over the top of the building shines back further towards other things and it's not real bright back there but it's bright enough i mean you get a really dark night so I got more value out of my light by just getting it up about two feet to three feet higher above the building than having it down lower. And then again, it's on a switch. So some of the longer days in the summer, we don't always have that stuff on, but we're able to put them on. And I like putting them on that one, especially in the winter months, because it, it does add some light to all my cattle barns. So if we were to build a shop, so if we, let's say, didn't have this yet or just know about this or if we had to start over would i do this the same my initial thought before we redid the building that was here was no i would want to build one with the straight sides and a flat ceiling but i really got to thinking i talked to the rafter company which sells building materials for just about any shape of building you want and this is the most economical way to build for the amount of square footage you can get with the quonset look but the downside is, is trying to utilize your walls for shelving or, or getting... So in a shop, for instance, typically your sides are always all your small tools and, and your small equipment stuff ends up along the sides and then your larger stuff ends up in the middle anyway. So being that the roof comes in fast, it doesn't necessarily affect the use of that building. You're able to utilize everything. And then the idea of the slope floor. We'd have never planned it that way, but if I had to do it again, that little slope that's in here, the only way it would interfere with anything if we were trying to build some structure and using levels to build it, where the, the, whatever we were working on had to be level, we'd have to block it up and make the, the base of it level first to go off of that. Other than that, it doesn't make any difference. It's, um, the slope doesn't affect how the how this building can get used. So there's not a lot we would change. And then the shelving, we only had those gables we could use for shelving, and maybe that's enough. So if we were to do it again, there's few changes I would make. It, I would either have more cords on our, on our laminated rafter or put more rafters in to get it 
stronger and so we were able to run the steel all the way up to um, handle more weight. That is it for the video about how this building came to be. How this Quonset shed built in the 1970s was transformed into the main heated workshop here on my father's dairy farm. We're going to split this video into two parts. The next video will be uh, about uh, his uh, shop setup when it comes to his tools and uh, how he laid out his workbenches and things like that. Uh, it just got too long to have it all in one video. So if you're at all interested in that, make sure to stay tuned for that video. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure to like and subscribe and check out our other videos. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.